Welcome to Debt Free in 30, the live edition. Mortgage rates are way up. So what do you do if your goal someday is to buy a house? And what if your mortgage is up for renewal? What should you do? Ron Butler is here. Let's begin. This is Debt Free in 30, the live webcast. Let's get started. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. It is Monday, October 23rd, 2023, 2 p.m. Toronto time, and this is the live edition of Debt Free in 30. Normally, we record Debt Free in 30 on a Monday and release it Saturday morning to give us time to edit the different camera angles and create the show notes, but things are moving so fast that I thought we should go live so that we can give you the most up-to-date information possible. To do that, Making his sixth appearance on the podcast, I'm joined by Ron Butler, founder of Butler Mortgage and the host of the Angry Mortgage Podcast. Ron, welcome back. Are you ready to talk about mortgages? I'm sitting on ready. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So so here we go. So um, this is Debt Free in 30. This isn't the Angry Mortgage Podcast. And since I don't know how it works when you're live on YouTube, we've decided to do this podcast with no swearing just so we don't get banned, but I'm sure you're going to have uh, no trouble uh, expressing your opinions. Are, are we good there, Ron? Well, there's been a lot of questions about the swearing on my social media. There have been a ton of questions. I just finished explaining to someone in a reply that I actually can go a whole hour without swearing. Uh, but then, of course, as soon as the hour is up, i got to go outside and start cursing like a <laughs> lunatic. So that's... That's well, what happens. I got to store it up for an hour. Well, so what we're going to try to do is keep this to like forty-five minutes, and then you'll then you'll be fine. So, so here's oh, the uh, just cut loose. So <laughs> just, just cut loose. loose. It'll, it'll yeah, be yeah. it'll be fantastic. So again, you want to hear the swearing? Go to Angry Mortgage Podcast. Uh, you we'll put all the links in the show notes. So so here's the plan. If you're watching on YouTube, you can type your questions in the comment box, and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. And I know that typing in all caps is is generally considered to be rude, but for today. If you have a question, please type it in all caps and we're more likely to be able to see it. So, Ron, I want to start with some history, okay? And we'll we'll put some graphics up on the screen for the, the people who are watching on YouTube here, which I guess is everyone because that's the only live version at the moment. On March 1st, 2022, the Bank of Canada prime rate was 25 basis points. You remember that, Ron, back, uh, back in the old days? That's one quarter. I remember that. You remember that? Okay, so that's one quarter of 1%, so virtually nothing. Then on March 2nd, 2022, which is exactly 600 days ago. So that's, that's why we're doing this podcast today. It's actually a fluke, but it's exactly 600 days ago. The Bank of Canada raised rates by 25 basis points, meaning they doubled the interest rate. And they've kept on raising them 10 times in total in the last year and a half. And now the Bank of Canada target overnight rate after the most recent increase on July 12th is 5%. Now... Our listeners are going, wow, from 0.25 to 5, that's an increase of 4.75. That's a lot. But, of course, it's actually a lot worse than that because to get from 25 basis points to 450 basis points, that is a 20 times increase, if I'm doing the math correctly. Now, by way of comparison, March 1st, 2022, the minimum wage in Ontario was 15 bucks an hour. If it had gone up 20 times, obviously it would be 300 bucks an hour now. It ain't. I'm pretty sure that is, that is not the case. As of October 1st, it's 1655 an hour, so that's an increase of just over 10%. So obviously mortgage rates are going up a lot faster than what employees are earning. So first question to you, Ron, like what are you seeing? Are you, what, what's happening in the mortgage world? Are these much higher interest rates causing a lot of consternation from pe for people? Has it flowed through? What, do you, what exactly are you seeing? Okay, for people who have mortgages, um, there's some people are blissful. I mean, some people don't have a renewal until 2026. They're a little worried about 2026, but right now their interest rate is 1.79%. So they're not too worried at all. They're 1.79% for the next couple of years. We got a bunch of people who are worried who are in variable rates. They're worried. Uh, some of those rates have gone straight up. The payments have gone up 50, 55, nearly 60%. Um, some people have variable rates, they haven't gone up, but they see what the future will bear and it ain't good because they can, they, there was at one point CIBC showed amortization at, with an infinity sign, you know, that infinity sign mm -hmm. from Greek, but, but yeah, yeah, that's not good when your amortization is infinity. Some of those mortgages are all actually growing. We have variable rate mortgages because the bank did not increase any of the payments, but the interest rate went way up. So the payment doesn't cover the interest, and those mortgages get bigger every single month. 
Uh, we got people who've got renewals coming up in the next few months. All of them know that the payment's going to go up very substantially. The interest rate will double or triple. And those folks are worried. It's as simple as that. Well, I did some show prep, Ron, because, you know, I like to do my show prep. And I went to the Bank of Canada. I, I know you know all the, the guys. And we're not going to get you to do your Tiff McCallum uh, impersonation today. But well, maybe we'll see how the show goes. People and love that. I though. know they People do. Love they, that they, they, they love it. They love it. So... According to the Bank of Canada, and I'm, I'm quoting from their website, the mortgage debt service ratio measures the share of income a home buyer dedicates to their mortgage debt payments. Okay, that makes sense. I understand what that means. All else being equal, a household that spends a large portion of its income on mortgage payments may be more vulnerable to financial stress. It may be more likely to be fall behind on debt payments. That makes sense. The higher your mortgage is, the, the, yeah. you know, the, the more problem you can have. So I'm going to put up a chart here that shows the mortgage debt service ratio. And the bank uses the share of new mortgages with a mortgage DSR of greater than 25% to identify the most vulnerable households. And so what this chart shows is that in the first quarter of 2020, the share of all new mortgages with a mortgage debt service ratio greater than 25% was 11%, a relatively low number. As of the second quarter of this year, so just before the summer started, that had gone up to 29%. This is like your old hockey stick graph. Does that surprise you? Not in the slightest. I mean, some of those, some of those variable rate changes haven't even been processed yet because they're in static payment mode. Uh, yeah, it's, just, it's going to be pretty hockey stickish for the next year, year and a half. Now, I want to show you one more chart here, and this is a chart I made up. And you're going to tell me if I'm wrong here. So if I want to buy the average house, okay, and it, let's assume I've got a 20% down payment. So I went on the interweb and I did research and it said that the, um, in March of 2020, the average home price in the GTA was around 900000 and it's been going up, actually in March of 2022, it was almost $1.3 million. As of September 2023, it's now $1.1 million, give or take. Now, whether those numbers are accurate, let's just yeah. assume they are. So 20% down payment. My mortgage on a 1.1 million house is around 900000 Assuming the five-year fixed interest rate, 25-year amortization right now is around 5.5%, that means my monthly mortgage payment would be 5400 bucks. Back in March of 2020, on the $900,000 house at a 2.63% interest rate, my monthly payment would have only been $3,300. So clearly, mortgage rates have gone way up. That's a no-brainer. What's interesting to me is that the income required back in March of 2020 to buy the average house in the GTA was about 90000 and today it's around 150000 But you don't think that number on my chart is accurate. Why not? Well, I know it's not accurate because you must apply a stress test in Canada to all new purchases. So instead of, if your mortgage rate was about five and a half percent we must stress test it at seven and a half percent that's the that's the rules of all federal uh financial institutions got to have a stress test and most provincial institutions as well, as well have followed along so i'd say 95 percent of every kind of lender you've got a two percent stress test so at 7.5 instead of 5.5 5, you need a family income of about hundred and ninety four thousand dollars to get that house and the stress test back in March of 2020 was still the same. It was two points. So yep. my number, when I said 90,000, well, it was actually 120,000 or whatever it was. But it's, the, the point is it's way higher now. It's just, just, yep. just way higher. So that is clearly a problem, right? Like that is, that is clearly a problem. So I want to uh, play a question from a listener. We, we put, uh, put the word out for people to, uh, to send us questions. And this is a fairly common question that we received. So I want you to listen to this and, and give me your response. So listener question time. Here is question number one. Hi, I've been saving for about the last five or six years and renting a place that is very affordable for me and allows me to, as I mentioned, save um, at the same time, which I know is rare in this current climate. I have been also playing the game of waiting for uh, the housing market to, uh, for lack of a better term, collapse a little bit and be able to move in and purchase my first house, hopefully when the prices stabilize a bit. I'm sure this is a question you get asked all the time, but 
is this something where I should be waiting longer and seeing how this economic um, kind of landscape plays out in the next little bit, including interest rates? Or do you recommend kind of jumping in whenever you can afford? Uh, would love your thoughts on this. So what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that some of it depends on where you live. Uh, the market in Alberta continues to improve. The market in for house prices in most other provinces in Canada deteriorates. So here's what we know. If interest rates are this high, house prices come down in almost every region with the possible exception of uh, Alberta, but it may catch up to Alberta too. So if it's coming down, prices are coming down, when do they stop coming down? When is the best time to buy? Well, if I'm one of those somewhat dubious folks who always say it's don't try to time the market, it's just time in the market, I would say the best time to buy is just immediately. But to my mind, that's completely false. We can definitely believe that there will be lower house prices next year, January, February, March, than there are this year. That just seems to be the logical trend. Because we don't see any instantaneous moment in the next three or four months when interest rates suddenly fall. There is no sign of that. There's no real prediction of that by any serious person. Uh, so, yeah, you might as well just relax, watch the market for another four or five months, and then start studying it then. Yeah, and I agree with you. And I think you have said many times that prediction is a fool's game. Am I quoting you correctly on that? It was a swear word involved. Yes, okay, okay? that's right. But, but yeah, it's, that, a, it's, a bad, it's a bad business. There you it's go. definitely a bad business. Because we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think, well, I mean, I've been saying on, on Twitter for the last few weeks that I think um, interest rates have peaked. In fact, I don't know if I can do this or not, but let's let's throw up a chart of the five-year bond yield. You can't see this, Ron, because you can only see me, but um, what I'm showing right now is is the, the daily chart. So as of right now, as we're, we're doing this, it's somewhere around uh, 12 minutes after 2 Toronto time on uh, October 23rd as we're broadcasting live. The five-year bond rate is 4.194%. It's down 0.58%, which is about 1.36% on the day. Obviously, a daily chart is a silly thing to put up because it, it doesn't mean anything. But if you throw up the, uh, the monthly chart, you can see that interest rates peaked on October the 3rd at uh, about just under 4.5%. They had a little spike up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And uh, over the last, well, obviously so far today, they've been continuing to fall. Um, so I have, have said, well, I'm, I think that that day, October 3rd, is when interest rates peaked. Do you believe that, or do you think that there is the chance that there will be a further increase in uh, interest rates? And I believe we have our friend, uh, your friend Tiff is speaking again this week. We have another, uh, is it October the 25th that they announced their, their next rate increase? So Two questions for you. Do you, think, right. do you think they're going to do anything on October 25th? And do you think rates have peaked or do they still have farther to go? I think there is no change on October 25th. I think that there is enough validity to the thought that the recession is just about to show up in the next quarter or two. There's enough signs. There's enough indications. Uh, because... TIFF doesn't need inflation to be completely destroyed. He doesn't need to see the number two. He needs to know that his plan works, that his plan of harming the economy, causing unemployment, causing economic contraction through increases in interest rates has worked. When he sees that it's worked, he doesn't have to do too much after that. It'll take care of itself. But there is the specter of what happens in the United States, because we are not in charge of what happens to the U.S. Federal Reserve. We are not in charge of what happens in their economy. If their economy continues to be extremely robust in the United States, and the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell wants to crush inflation harder, uh, that he doesn't see the weakness that Tiff Macklin may see in our economy, he can increase. And if uh, the Federal Reserve Governor increases once, twice, maybe three times, then our Bank of Canada doesn't have much choice but to follow along a little bit. 
In other words, they don't have to go up 50 basis points if Jerome Powell moves up 50, but they might feel the, the need to go up another quarter percent. It's all unknown. It's all speculation at this point, but there's a possibility. The possibility is lurking. So I can't advise anybody that to be sure that rates are about to tip the scales and start falling. I don't believe we're going to see that soon, but have rates peaked? Truth is, I don't know. And as we've discussed before, the bond market works somewhat independently of prime rate. It's not, it's got a definite correlation, but it's not just tied. So we're going to have to see what happens to the bond market because the turmoil in the U.S. Treasury market is remarkable right now. It's, it's movements that people haven't seen for decades. People haven't seen this since the great financial crisis. And in some ways, there's more at stake because the bond market's bigger than it was back then. So we're just going to have to sit back and watch. Might be the peak. We're just going to have to see what happens. And, yeah, just sit back and, and you know, fasten your seatbelts, I guess. So, um, okay. And, and I, I mean, obviously, I think they've peaked, but what do I know? I mean, if, if he announces that he's going to increase them later this week, you and I will both be surprised. But we won't be yep. completely shocked. Like, it's like, okay, he, he's looking at inflation. He wants to keep uh, inflation low. And the way to do that is to, um, to raise interest rates. Now, I think you and I are of the same mind that there is a massive time lag to all of this. So if you raise interest rates today or, you know, 600 days ago, it doesn't instantly crash, crash the market. And in fact, when you look at the stats, the banks publish their default rates on mortgages and what are the default rates right now, roughly? They are remarkably small. They haven't actually changed much during the whole course of this uh, vast increase in interest rates. Now, uh, I have to use the term basis point. A basis point is one hundredth of one percent. So the 90-day default rate for most of the last 18 months, two years, in Canada has been 15 basis points. That's less than a quarter percent of all mortgage holders, um, quite a bit less, like almost a half of a quarter percent, uh, are in default. They are, they're not, they're 90 days behind their payments. And that is remarkably low for any country. I mean, maybe Switzerland's a little better, but uh, the United States runs consistently higher than that at all times, even in good times. So what I'm suggesting is the default rate, the people who are really, really in trouble on their mortgages, it's minimal in Canada right now. We'll probably see some a bit of an uptick at the next uh, announcement of bank quarterly results. That's probably going to go up a little, uh, but it would if it doubled, Doug. If it doubled to like thirty-four or thirty-six basis points, that would just be the mean. That would just be the average mean of what default is. So we're currently running at half of normal. So. Um, it's actually pretty good. Okay, I don't understand. So I said in the intro, in my research here, that the Bank of Canada prime rate has gone up 20x, and yep. yet you're saying that pretty much nobody's defaulting on their mortgage. How is that possible? Well, I'm, I'm saying it at the banks, at the finance, big financial institutions. There's lots of people defaulting on private mortgages. Uh, there's people who are defaulting uh, on uh, mortgages with uh, mortgage investment companies. Uh, there's people defaulting on their construction loans. But the big banks who underwrite these mortgages ferociously, carefully, uh, the big banks who have this have to use the stress test so that everybody who got a mortgage two years ago had to qualify at a much higher rate, big banks who, you know, they can, they can turn people down. And that means that some people who shouldn't have had a mortgage didn't get a mortgage from a big bank. They got it somewhere else. So... That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that everybody in Canada is paying on time. I'm saying the big banks and similar lending institutions are, are kind of super select today. I mean, they, they don't have the kind of exposure that they might have had 10 years ago. Maybe that's a good thing, but it's factual. And so if I'm going out and buying a house, um, I'm going to call up a mortgage broker. might be, you know, Butler Mortgage, who knows? And you're going to find me the, the best rate, the best terms. In if I've got decent credit and I've got a twenty percent down payment, 
is it highly likely that you're going to place my mortgage with one of the big banks if it's a conventional first mortgage? We didn't ask the next and possibly today the most important thing because most of the people know if they're going to go for a mortgage, they got to have decent credit. Most people know that. I'd say 98% of people know that already. Um, 98% of people understand how much down payment they have to have. Their real estate agent tells them what they've got to have to make something work. What we're up against is income qualification. You know, you mentioned earlier that you needed to make $194,000 a year to qualify for a bank mortgage at uh, these rates we have today, plus the stress test, plus the interest rate. Not a whole hell of a lot of people have a family income. Sorry, there was a tiny swear. There. <laughs> Not a whole heck of a lot of people have uh, a close to a $200,000 family income. If you look at it statistically, that's almost only 12, maybe 11% of the Canadian population even come close to that. So um, you might have a problem getting a mortgage, given what you just said, 20% down payment, great credit, but if you don't have enough income, you may not get that mortgage from a bank. And as a result, you then consider a private lender is what you're saying. You can consider first an alternative lender, uh, there are institutions that have been set up and have arrangements with uh, the regulators, the bank regulators, to offer uh, higher rates and lower loan to values to offer uh, mortgages to people who are in that sort of an income difficulty. Uh, but you may not qualify with them. And yes, in that case, um, you're probably looking at a private, some kind of private lending, yes. And the interest rate charged by a private lender presumably is higher than what would be charged at a conventional lender, which is... Yeah, all the banks always, the banks and their similar lenders like First National or MCAP, uh, they are representative of the lowest rates people can get in Canada, the lowest mortgage rates. However, uh, there's a whole cadre of others who are higher. Uh, now, here's the interesting part. Since bank interest rates have gotten as high as they have, in some ways there's not a ton of difference. You know, we're we're looking at private lending today at about nine and a half on a first mortgage. So if a bank is six point five on that same mortgage, it's not double. It's not even fifty percent more. And some people may go that route, but the trouble with getting to nine and a half percent. There's just not that many people who can afford it. I mean, it, it just puts people off the whole concept of purchasing. Well, yeah. I mean, you said it's $194,000 in income to qualify for a mortgage with a 20% down payment on a $1.1 million house. And that's at an interest rate of 5.5%. You jack it up to 9.5%, well, of course, you're you're blowing through the numbers then. So that becomes that becomes a lot more. So, okay, so for people who are watching us live, again, on YouTube, in the comments section, you can uh, type your questions, put them in all caps, and we'll, we'll grab them. Um, we did have a, another question that came in from a, uh, a listener. I want to play that for you and get your response. So here's another question. Hi, guys. Uh 30 somethings here. We make about 110,000 a year. We've got a, about a 5% deposit saved for a 400,000, $420,000 home. We're in the Niagara region, looking pretty much all over Niagara, maybe even a little bit outside. We've been watching the market. House of prices don't seem to be going down where we need them to be. So we're just kind of playing down debt, um, some very small credit card debts, and um, we have student loans and stuff from the OSAP. But uh, just want to know what you'd recommend in terms of priorities here. Like, you know, we have pre approval or had a pre approval for that range of price, but they're not coming down. So we're just kind of going to focus on paying debts off so we can be debt free pretty much. And uh, maybe we go into this in 2024 with a new strategy, uh, maybe a little larger approval. But just want to see your opinions on this. Thanks. What do you think? Well, there's never anything wrong with paying down debt. I mean, it is universally a good thing. There's uh, particularly consumer debt, because consumer debt's running between 10 and 28%. So yeah, every time you pay down a credit card, it's to your advantage. Now, one of the first things I'd say about the house price issue, first thing I'd say is patience. Have, be, be a little patient. We might see a, a bit of a different world in the next six months. I'm not talking about 50% off, but I'm, I am talking about the possibility of another 10% price reduction from the absolute peak, maybe 15%. And the other consideration is move. Move to Alberta. Move to Edmonton. You're going to be able to get a beautiful house for $450,000. I get it. Not everybody can move to Edmonton. Not everybody wants to live in Winnipeg. Not everybody wants to uh, move to Quebec. Maybe not. French might not be strong. 
uh, I get it. People do want and deserve to stay in their homes, where they live, where they have friends, where they have family. I get it. But the reality of life is the house you can buy in Edmonton for $450,000 is beautiful. It's huge. It's fabulous. Uh, and it's in a great neighborhood. I, I know. It's crazy, right? I mean, $450,000, buy a beautiful home. By the way, if you can get the right kind of visa for 350000 U.S., you could have the most gorgeous home just outside of Houston, Texas that you'd ever want. So there are different prices in different places for sure. But yeah. be patient. Things may change in the next five months. Yeah, and you're right. It's, you know, if I have a job working at that company over there and I'm in the office five days a week, the commute from Edmonton to uh, Mississauga is, good, is yeah. a, a real bugger every month or every day. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that was a half a swear word. I know. Though, sorry. We're, we're, so, we're yeah. going to edit yeah. both of these things out. I don't know if you can edit a live broadcast <laughs> or not. But um, and I agree with you, your initial comment there about paying down debt. Obviously, I'm in the debt business. This is Debt Free and 30. That's the name of the podcast. And I'm a big believer in keeping your debt as low as possible, particularly if you've got consumer debt. If you're carrying interest on a credit card at 20%, there is no way there's any investment where you can be earning 20% after tax. It's just not a thing. So getting that paid down is, is obviously a no, uh, no-brainer. Now, I want to ask you about the perceptions of people that you meet with. So I, like you, talk to a lot of people. I mean, I talk to a lot of people every day. And if I'm talking to someone who's in their 20s or 30s or maybe even in their 40s, they say to me, you know what? I will never buy a home. It's just it's just not a thing. They have completely lost hope. And losing hope is bad, of course, because it leads to one of three possible outcomes. Either you go, well, you know, life goes on, but I, I guess I'll never own a house, but I'm perfectly happy renting, so no big deal. I can travel more. It's, it's all good. The second response is, well, I start engaging in some more risky behavior because I want to build up the money for a down payment. I want to buy that million dollar condo or house. So I need to accumulate a couple hundred thousand dollars for a down payment, but I can only save like 5,000 bucks a year given the job I'm at. So it's going to take me 40 years. So I'm going to invest in stocks or crypto or NFTs or whatever it takes to make a buck. And obviously that's dangerous because you can end up losing a ton of money. Or the third option is I just give up. I say, you know what, this is hopeless. Why bother even trying? There's no point in working hard and trying to get a better job if I'm never going to be able to earn enough income to advance. I might as well work as little as possible and, you know, just I'm just going to say forget it. Um, and I'm hearing that more and more from people. Do you hear that same sense of, of hopelessness? And do you have any comments or advice on that other than what you already said, which is to be patient? Well, I hear it constantly. I even hear it from our own employees who are in that age bracketing, who are between 28 and 38 years old. Um, and it's serious. It's serious for this country. It might be a reason why if an election was held today, um, the federal liberals would uh, lose 100 seats. I mean, it's, it's people are angry. Uh, people are, are, they're upset. I mean, how did this happen? What's the fairness of this? What is the fairness that a person 20 years ago or 25 years ago only had to pay between three and four times their average income to purchase a home in Ontario or in parts of British Columbia? And today, that number looks a lot more like 10 times. Like, what happened in 20 years? First of all, wages were stagnant, but these house prices went completely nuts. I have another catchphrase I use, but we're not mm -hmm. using it today. Uh, the reality is that they have every right to feel badly used. I mean, like, what happened in 20 years? That it used to be three or four times income? Welcome to nine to ten times income for me. For me, that 30-year-old person. Uh, how did this happen? Why did this happen? What's the failure of my government? What's the failure of my community? How did this happen? It's an excellent question, and so far... Every politician, whether it's federal, provincial, municipal, has been a complete failure in answering that question. I mean, you literally couldn't find worse outcomes than on the housing file in the last 10 years or worse or, or absence of solutions, absence of a, of, a, of a fix. We're in the middle of it and people are mad and I think it's going to reflect in voting patterns. Yeah, and... We should also acknowledge that this is just not a Canadian thing. The, these issues are in many other countries as well. 
because many other governments have enacted the same kind of policies while well, it kind of is the same everywhere. I mean, you made the comment earlier that interest rates in Canada are very closely correlated with interest rates in the United States. That's just the way it is. So even if we do have a new government, is there anything specific they can even do to fix this mess? Or is it, um, there, there's just nothing more that, uh, that they can do? Well, there's actually a ton of things they can do. Uh, they can radically restrict not foreign buyers of homes. They can radically restrict foreign money coming into the country to buy real estate. They can make a massive attempt to change empty house policy. Like We have empty homes all over Ontario, all over British Columbia, not necessarily in Alberta or Quebec, but we have empty homes in these provinces. They are homes purchased by people who maybe offshore now or may just be the children of people who are offshore who've sent money here to buy houses as a kind of a safety deposit box that's a house we can say well if there's an empty home by the way this is coming we have empty home taxes in some cities but if this was a more aggressively sought effort to say well if you're going to leave your home empty we're going to charge you five percent of the value of the house per year now, that kind of tax is going to create attention from everybody. Those empty homes are going to get people in them. Next, uh, restrict foreign money coming into the country. That'll be a, a big b bonus. We're listening today to governments all over the place. They're talking about restricting short-term rental. At the end of the day, Airbnb, in most situations, just represents an illegal hotel room. It's taken long-term rental and, and turned it into short-term rental. And it's also turned possibly first-time buyer homes into a kind of a illegal short-term rental. Now, how does that affect people buying homes? How does that affect prices? Well, if you're going to turn your uh, condo uh, intentionally into an illegal hotel room, you could derive a lot more revenue and a lot lower property taxes than a hotel does or that a long-term rental or that even you could do as a homeowner. It's just a source of profit. And, and let's face it, in 2021, in southern Ontario, one third of all home buyers were investors. So that means a whole lot of people who might have wanted to buy a house didn't get the chance to buy a house to live in. So there are a ton of things that could be done. And if we start to take legitimate action on these things, it could help. Well, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Sean to put up on the screen your Twitter handle, which is now, of course, called X. And so all the politicians who are watching can uh, can tweet you and you can give them a, a full breakdown on, on what they should do. Um, they've never listened to me. So whether they'll listen to you or not, I don't know. But it's uh, at Ron Mortgage, guys, is how people can find you. Now, we got another question from a, a viewer here. Um, oops, we have two pre-cons, one at uh, 1.1 that might not appraise. Would it make sense to assign it at a loss since there's no real mortgage pay down for years at these rates? So just so everyone watching knows what pre-con means, that means pre-construction. So I'm buying a condo, they have to build the building. So the builder says, hey, I'm going to sell all the units in advance. Everyone give me a hundred grand. Now I've got money to put the shovels in the ground and start building the building. And it's going to take two, three, five years to build the building. And when it's actually built, then you give me the rest of the money. The problem is, um, as this person says, we've got, uh, we, we bought the, the pre-con, assuming a price of $1.1 million. And now that the building is about to be finished, it is appraising for less than that price. So the question is, would it make sense to assign the pre-con at a loss since there's just no real mortgage pay down for years at these rates? So the correct answer is probably yes. I have to say probably because there is a bunch more analysis has to go into it than just a an online question but look at it this way if you may not even be able to get a mortgage like the rates may have gone so high that your only option is for private lending and that's a terrible option in many cases or you can't do anything at all you you don't have enough money to to deal with the appraisal failure you don't have enough money to come up with enough down payment to even get a private mortgage you may have no choice but to try to unload that pre-construction condo at a loss. That may be your most optimal financial decision because everything else is worse. I mean, that is possible. So short of in-depth analysis on that file, 
if you can't get a mortgage or you can't raise enough cash to increase the down payment to cover the appraisal difficulty, you may have no choice. You just may have to sell at a loss. Yes. Yeah, and you made the comment about more in-depth analysis, and I think that's a very good point because we're not dealing with full information here. This is a, a YouTube podcast at the moment. My advice to everyone in that situation is talk to an expert. If it's a mortgage issue, then you should be talking to a mortgage broker. If you've got more debt than you can handle, probably talking to a licensed insolvency trustee wouldn't be a bad idea because if you're uh, potentially having trouble closing on your pre-con, well, perhaps you've got other debts and other issues. Clearly, you don't have $10 million sitting in the bank, probably, or else we, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So I think you definitely want to look at all the different options, make sure you are uh, considering what the, what the correct option is. Um, because if, so I bought the, the condo, I put down, I don't know, 100 grand up front, and then maybe there was a milestone where I had to put in a bit more money, but the big number is coming due when the, the building closes, at which point I need to get a mortgage for $800,000 or whatever the number is. If I can't get the mortgage, then obviously I can't close on the deal. So I assume the builder is going to sell that pre-con to someone else, and they're going to keep my deposit, obviously. But if they if the prices have come down so much that even the deposit doesn't cover whatever it was supposed to cover, in other words, the builder loses money on the deal, I guess they've got the ability to come after me for the shortfall, right? They will absolutely litigate for the shortfall because the case law in Ontario is perfect. I'm not perfect in every province, and there's different rules in every province about this stuff, but in Ontario, uh, if, the, if the construction company, the developer has to sell at a further loss than your deposit covered, they're going to litigate you. They're going to sue you. They're going to come after you because the case law says in all cases, they win. I mean, there's been tons of case law on this over the last 20 years. It's very old law. It's very established. They're going to win. And at that point, they may be driven, the, the, that person may be driven to call you, Doug, because mm -hmm. that's the only escape from having once a court has said you have to pay another 100 grand. That's really the only escape from it. Yep, and I, I've shown this chart as well um, many other times, and that is the Hoyes Michaelis Homeowners Bankruptcy Index, which shows the number of people who are filing an insolvency with us who, who own a home at the time they file their insolvency. And back in 2011, it was around 35%. So about a third of my clients owned a home at the time they went insolvent, but it didn't really matter because house prices were so low, there wasn't much equity in it, it, it wasn't a big deal. But now here we are in, uh, well, this is our, our data goes back to September. Last month, it was 5%. So back during 2022, it was, it was 0%. Everybody who owned a home uh, was fine. They weren't filing insolvency. But those numbers are going to change, and we're certainly probably going to see uh, different, uh, um, different results going forward uh, starting next year. So we'll, we'll see what happens. This is available on our website. You can just type in the Hoys Michaelis Homeowners Bankruptcy Index, and, uh, and everybody can see it. So, um, okay, I'd like to play another uh, listener question for you here. This one's a little bit different. So uh, let's see what your thoughts are on this one. Hi, I've been saving for about the last five or six years and renting a place that is very affordable for me and allows me to, as I mentioned. Oh, sorry, I already played that question. Let's try this one. Should there be legal ramifications for mortgage brokers and real estate agents who knowing farewell that they were giving mortgages or selling properties that were at extremely elevated prices, should there not be any kind of a moral responsibility in that situation. What do you think of that? Well, uh, you know, I actually sympathize with the, with the concept. Um, you know, it, it doesn't work under law, it doesn't work under capitalism, but I sympathize with the idea that some people feel misled. I mean, I, I, can, I can live with that. I don't think our company misled too many people, but there were situations where there's no question People were encouraged to get over their heads. Uh, there was a whole uh, market CBC marketplace documentary uh, featuring uh, real estate agents and mortgage brokers who were telling people to buy as much house as you want because I'm going to build you out fake income documents that are going to allow you to get that house. As long as you got a down payment, we'll get you in. As long as you got a down payment, decent credit, we'll get you in. You don't have to worry about your income. So there's no question that some people were encouraged in, in the wrong way. 
but mostly not. Like, here's the counter argument to that. If you bought a house in 2000 and sold it in 2021 and made a million dollars, I don't think you should be sharing your million dollars with, with the people who took a beating. I mean, that's reality. So it is business. It is capitalism. Uh, nobody forced anyone to buy anything or sell anything. But I do sympathize with the idea that we had a Bank of Canada governor who said, interest rates will be low for long. And it weren't that long. It was just a few months and they started going up. So you can certainly be uh, sympathetic to people who are now in kind of a world of hurt. But yeah, nobody's going to get prosecuted. I can assure you that one. Yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen. Well, and, and I have a great deal of, of empathy as well, because for exactly the reasons you've said, there are people who did everything right. They tried their best. So the governor of the Bank of Canada says interest rates are going to be low for long. Okay, I guess I should buy a house then because, uh, you know, rates are low. And I guess I should take a variable rate mortgage because that's the cheapest rates. That's the obviously prudent thing to do. Uh, everybody else is buying a house. Everybody has always said that owning a home is the, the foundation of your financial security. Uh, even though I did write a book where I said the opposite, but that's another story for another day. But um, and and so, what are you supposed to do? You talk to your parents, and they say, "Well, we bought a house in 1950, and look at how much it went on our grandparents." Everybody, it has always been the correct strategy. And in fact, prior to last year, you go back five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. The correct strategy was buy as big a house as you possibly could, get as much a mortgage as you could, lever yourself up as much as you could, because even if you bought the worst house in the worst neighborhood it still went up and lower interest rates saved you and that was that obviously times have changed now interest rates have gone way up and as a result it, the the world is nowhere near what it what it used to be so i think it's um disingenuous for you know old guys like you and me and i define old as like anybody over the age of 40 who remembers what it was like to buy a house for two hundred thousand dollars in the gta and well, interest rates were really high back then. Yeah, but the house was two hundred thousand bucks. You weren't paying five or six or seven thousand dollars a month in mortgage payments. So it is different now. I think that's that's something people people have to emphasize. Okay, so I told you I would not keep you uh, past forty five minutes because I don't want you to explode. Let's finish with one final question, which is: so for people listening, what is your advice? You know, wh what do you see for the future? What uh, what what concluding comments would you like to make to the as assembled listeners today? First thing I'd say is that uh, I think house prices will fall in Ontario and British Columbia, but more so in Ontario. I'm not really that big an expert on British Columbia, and there's just a lot of you know, it, there's parts of British Columbia that. Are just so hemmed in by geography that you know those prices might stay high, um, but they'll come off a bit. They all, in Ontario, we will see lower house prices in the new year. I don't know how long that'll last, but it will be lower than today uh, because the number of houses being sold is literally falling off a cliff. We're heading for 25, 30 year lows in house sales, which is really remarkable because there's three million more people here than there was 25 years ago. So it's really entered into a tough stage. So prices will come off. There will be opportunities. I will say that I think there will be some sort of change in government policy to try to help people in this, try to deal with these super high prices. Uh, I, I don't think any government can survive ignoring the housing problems in Canada. I think we're seeing that develop right now. So there may be some, eventually be some help on the way. Uh, and I also think that eventually interest rates come down. I mean, I, 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 you suggested that they peaked. I don't know if they've peaked. Uh, I'm not that smart, but uh, you're smarter than me, obviously. But, uh, I mean, it's you, you've got the biggest uh, bankruptcy firm in, in Ontario, insolvency firm in Ontario, so you, you're a smart guy. Uh, I'm just one of a million mortgage brokers. Seems like a million, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's just mortgage brokers that are on every corner. But uh, I'm not that smart. But I do believe that someday soon in a year maybe less rates will be lower and when rates are lower there's more opportunities to purchase a home uh renewals won't be quite so torturous as they are today i mean you gotta feel sorry for a person who has a, a 2.49 mortgage rate all of a sudden faced with 6.49 i mean that is a big big jump no matter who you are uh so i think we're going to see some relief there next year so things will get a little bit better um but you know what we're not going to see 1.995 year fixed again. I'm not in my lifetime. By the way, Doug, if you think people 
over just around 40 or old, I've got body parts I'm willing to sell to get back to 40, okay? Like, honestly, like I, 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 there's a couple of pieces of me I could give up if I, I could get back to 40 years old, that's for sure. Well, I'm 59, so 40, I guess you're right, seems like a, a long way in the in the past. So, it, and, you know, in, in terms of my level of intelligence, Ron, just because someone has a podcast on YouTube doesn't make them smart. That's that's a thing uh, that... That's a certainty, <laughs> yes, absolutely true. Both that's you right. and I, both you and I know, <laughs> know for sure. Well, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate that. So we're going to put it up on the screen here. People can find you on X, the X platform, which used to be called Twitter, um, at Ron Mortgage Guy, butlermortgage.ca. We'll put links in the show notes to, uh, to everything. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, my concluding comment is going to be, well, we're in for interesting times. That's for sure. Like, I don't know what's going to happen over the next few months uh, and years, but uh, it's, it's certainly going to be interesting. I think the basic advice to everybody is the same. You know, keep your expenses as low as possible. Kind of hard to do with food inflation and all the rest of it. Um, build up as big a down payment as possible before you buy a house. And you got you to gotta hope for the best. Um, and, Doug, we got to get you. Thank you so much for having me. But we got to get you on TikTok. TikTok is vital. I'm on TikTok. It's the most fun you could ever have. You can swear all you want to swear, and uh, you don't have to dance. It's called, people think you have to dance. You don't have to dance on TikTok. Well, wow, you young guys, you're all on TikTok. I'm I'm a little more stodgy, I guess, but uh, well, I will I will take that under advisement. That's that's my answer to that question. I'm not really sure what TikTok is, so I'll have to uh, have to investigate it. Uh, Ron, thanks very much. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Doug. Appreciate that. Thank you. So if you are watching on YouTube, which of course you are if you're watching the live broadcast, uh, please like and subscribe. Click the notification bell. We have a new show every week, usually Saturday morning. Uh, most of our listeners are on audio platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. So please subscribe. Um, I don't know if we're on TikTok, so I can't give you any comments on that. I'm, I'm sure we must be there. Uh, Ron Butler's podcast, the Angry Mortgage Podcast, is released every Tuesday, so that means there'll be a new episode tomorrow. And he also has lots of special uh, editions. So again, links in the show notes. That is our show for today. Thanks for being here with us live. Next week, it's back to our regular format. Please like and subscribe. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. Thanks for listening. That was Debt Free in 30. 